Okay. Okay, we have a few more people uh, wandering in at this point, but it's a good time to get started. Uh, welcome to the first uh, MIP webinar of the semester. Uh, my name is Eric Hudson. I'm going to be hosting it this semester. And uh, in addition to the people who are on the, in the room, we also have a number of people online who are listening to this. So if you can try to keep noise, paper shuffling, and stuff like that to a minimum so it doesn't interfere with the microphones, that would be great. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce today uh, one of our own, Slava Rukhin, uh, from the Department of Engineering, Science, and Mechanics, and also Biomedical Engineering. And he is going to be telling us about a new SNOM tool for nanoscale optical characterization. Okay, thank you, Eric. So maybe we can have a light a little bit lower. <coughs> All right, so uh, today I'm going to talk about um, the new instrument, um, which is facility available to use, which has been installed literally one month ago. The installation has been finished one month ago. And this is uh, scattering, scanning near field optical microscope. And that's what this abbreviation SSNOM stands for. So this instrument allows to get them. Um, I don't think um, this slide advanced. It, it did work. It's uh, it did work? the movie plays. Oh, the movie plays? Yeah. It already played. OK. But it's not moving to the next slide. But Let's hit next for the first time. That's fine. No. Something is stuck. It's not on the right. Uh, there we go. All right. OK, so uh, the outline of my talk today, uh, I'll start with some introduction into SSNOM. Um, this instrument is new for Penn State. And actually, it's relatively new for pretty much uh, most of the schools uh, uh, because the instrumentation has been developed about maybe five, seven years ago. Um, then I'll start talking about the imaging using the near field optical microscope. And uh, the first example that I'll present would be 2D metals. Then I'll move to the transition metal decalcagenite, uh, and I'll show how the imaging can be done at uh, different wavelengths of the excitation. I'll proceed to the high resolution SNOM and show how it could be used to extract materials information about twisted materials, twisted 2D materials bilayer and trilayer graphene in this particular case. I'll proceed to another mode of operation, which is the hyperspectral imaging. And uh, that will be um, uh, studied on the example of the plasma and phonon hybridization in graphene. And then I'll quickly talk about one of the methods of the uh, SNOM analysis. Um, um, SNOM naturally produces very big data, and there are multiple methods that can be applied there. Conclusions will follow. All right, so the introduction into near field microscopy. Um, and I cannot miss that slide. It shows the monument um, uh, in the University of Vienna uh, for Ernst Abend. And the uh, writing on this monument, uh, it shows the for, uh, famous Abbe formula, which is back to 1873. It's about the resolution of optical microscopy. So literally, what this formula says is that if you have two objects uh, in the optical uh, microscope, they produce an image. And this image uh, will show up um, as something resolvable um, only if the distance between the objects uh, is about the wavelength of the light. So to be more specific, if you think about the light diverging from some light source, say laser or another source, there is a propagation direction of the light, and Kx is the major wave vector of the light. But light always has a little bit of the perpendicular uh, of the momentum or the wave vector in the perpendicular direction. So that wave vector is related to the uncertainty in the determining of the size of the object. So here the situation is a little bit opposite. So the lens of the microscope collects the several light beams. And it collects this light beam within the angle alpha, which is so-called numerical aperture of the lens. So the resolution, the maximum resolution of the optical microscope is related to the wavelength of light. 
and also the numerical aperture of the lens, including the refraction index of the medium where the light is, is propagated. So this is a fundamental physical limit. Now, um, about 50 years after this paper came out, uh, Sinje came with his famous letter to Einstein, and then it, he published it in Philosophical Magazine, where he said, okay, there is a way to beat this fundamental diffraction limit. What uh, um, Sinje suggested in his paper, original paper, is that if you make a, um, a screen with a very small hole, such that this hole produces the light that can excite only one of these two objects, only say only red one compared to the green one, then you can see the curve shown here in bold. And if you move the screen or move the object, then you can consequently scan and measure and see the object with the resolution much smaller than the wavelength of light. So nowadays, uh, another 50 years after the original paper of Sinje, that has been realized by not using the screen with the aperture, but rather using the ultra sharp airtime heat. So uh, the uh, capability um, to obtain this image uh, uh, is um, outlined in this uh, um, animation. You scan FM over the sample and you shine the laser light at the same time. By doing so, you record the image and this image uh, has a resolution which is related to the radius of curvature of the tip and not the wavelength of the light. So this is the scheme of the instrument that we have here at the Penn State. And this instrument uh, contains several major units. So uh, by the way, this is the SNOM version number one, which we had for about uh, four months. Uh, and this is the current version uh, two. So there is a, a whole lot of instrumentation beyond the original one. So the original one had FM units. This is the heart of the instrument, the low noise room temperature atomic force microscope. And then it has several illumination units. So the version one had only mid infrared laser, which covers the range from six to 11 micrometers or nine, 10 to 16, 70 inverse centimeters, depending on which unit you prefer. And currently in the version two, we have also tunable visible laser with the optical parametric amplifier, uh, which covers the very broad range from 400 nanometers uh, with the different channels up to 4,000 nanometers or four micrometers. So total, the whole thing covers a range from, again, more than uh, two decades, um, almost two decades, I'm sorry, from 400 uh, nanometers to 11 microns. Uh, and it can be used in CW and pulsed operation. Uh, the imaging unit of the instrument is uh, interferometric based, and I'll explain that in detail soon. Uh, it has three detectors, uh, a middle thread detector, which is liquid nitrogen cooled and two short wavelength infrared and visible detectors. And of course, in principle, this unit is extendable. So in the future, we would like to add broadband, uh, broadband illumination and a PIR detection unit. We can add ultra fast uh, pump probe um, and uh, in principle, terahertz uh, tunable source and detector. So uh, of course, all of that is controlled by the computer. And these are typical images that you can obtain with this microscope. So the basis of your of operation. So when you shine the laser and you scan with the tip, the tip moves oscillatory. So it moves back and forth and also it scans along the sample. Um, the laser light produces optical signal. And as you can see in this image, the optical signal is the largest when the tip is at the smallest separation from the sample. And the reason is very simple. Uh, when you shine the laser light on the tip, you produce a dipole moment in the tip. And this dipole moment actually is function of both laser light, which we call external field, and also the field produced by the sample. Uh, which is easiest to describe as an image of the tip in the substrate, in the sample. So the image of the dipole produces electric field, which is schematically shown here. And this electric field depends on the image itself. So it depends on the distance between tip and sample. And that distance is modulated periodically because FM is uh, oscillating and the periodicity of that modulation will be used later. So the light is sent through so-called Max Zander interferometer, 
and I'll explain that on the next slide, and detected with the mid infrared or short wavelength near infrared or visible um, ATD. Okay, so the major uh, one, one of the major methods to detect light in the near field optical microscope is so called homodyne detection. What happens in the homodyne detection, the original laser is split into two arms. One arm goes through the sample, like I showed here in this schematic image, and the other arm is so-called reference arm. So it, it being reflected by a couple of mirrors, and then it recombines with the one which visited sample. As a result of this interference, we get the standard interference pattern so these two light beams can recombine and if the phase is exactly the same for both arms, they add together. The amplitudes add, the intensity, the amplitudes double, the intensity is four times the amplitude of the single beam. Or if there is a phase difference between the reference arm and the signal arm or sample arm, which is exactly pi, then they come with the counter phase and they kill each other. So the amplitude will be zero and the signal will be zero. So depending on the difference in the phase between those two, we can get uh, either zero or four times the original signal. So let me demonstrate it on the example of uh, uh, multi-layered graphene. So this sample is actually excellent sample to demonstrate the SNOM technique because this is a pretty bad sample. So the sample is very dirty as you can see. So what is shown here is the surface uh, of silicon silicon dioxide coated sometimes with the monolayer graphene and you can see these bright lines these are wrinkles of graphene and some uh, these are tears you can see these dark areas which are tears in the graphene and there is also a second layer of graphene somewhere here but you can barely see it or probably you don't see it in the standard AFM profile so the sample is very busy now if you look at the reflection from this sample, just optical reflection from this sample, you can see bright and dark lines. And this is this interference pattern that I mentioned to you before. So here they interfere uh, destructively, here they interfere constructively, but you don't get much signal of the sample, which will tell you about the materials properties or not, not just giving a better image than the atomic force microscope. What you can do then, because your tip is oscillating, you can do, uh, yeah, and the second uh, island of graphene is somewhere in this area. What you can do, you can actually detect the optical signal at the frequency of the modulation of the AFMT. So what is shown here is the demodulated optical signal. And as you can, you start seeing some features in this demodulated optical signal. However, you can look at the amplitude of that signal. You can look at the phase of that signal. And the both amplitude and phase, they show wavy pattern resembling the simple interference, uh, uh, DC interference as zero signal. So they're not very much suitable for studying the material. What you can do instead, uh, you can uh, look at the demodulation of the signal at the frequency, which is double of the frequency of the oscillation of the T. If you look at the second harmonic or second overtone of the major signal, the image becomes much less busy. The wavy pattern that you saw on the uh, first order harmonic is completely or almost completely gone. And you can see in the amplitude or in the phase, the area which has different intensity, different phase, and this area corresponds to the second layer of the thing. You can see also <coughs> multiple features that will correspond to the wrinkles and the uh, 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 ripples of the graphene and that can be studied in the next harmonic, in the third harmonic, what is shown here is the amplitude in the phase of the third harmonic. And I would like to tell you that all of these harmonics are detected simultaneously. So you look at the atomic force microscope profile, the zero harmonic, the first harmonic amplitude and phase, second harmonic and the third harmonic all together. So SNOM produces multiple channels and each of these channels in principle contains information about the material. So in order to get even better signal and remove the background noise, we move from the homodyne detection, which I explained on the previous slide, to so-called pseudoheterodyne detection. So the pseudoheterodyne detection is not very much different from the homodyne detection, 
The major difference is that the reference arm, which is shown here, uh, it does not have a constant phase difference. Instead, the bottom mirror moves up and down. This oscillation of the mirror changes the phase. And by looking at the uh, changing phase, we can do demodulation with much higher signal to noise ratio. So the way how it works is the following. So the reference arm has the phase and the phase has time dependent, which is shown here as the cosine of the frequency M times T time that produces sideband as shown here. So you can see the frequency, the zero frequency is the DC component which is the reflection of the light from the sample and the um, FM tip and everything else in DC. The omega band shows the same with the frequency of oscillation of the cantilever. Two omega is the second harmonic, three omega is the third harmonic. And the multiple bands, side bands that you see here, they correspond to the frequency of oscillation of the mirror, something like two omega plus M, two omega minus M and so forth. If you pick two of the sidebands, it happens that the sidebands, these overtones, they have the phase shift <coughs> proportional to the sideband number and imaginary i. Therefore, if you combine two of them, you can extract, if you take two overtones or two sidebands, you can extract real and imaginary component of the signal, s norm signal, or apps and argument of the complex impedance that you get under the tip. So as a result, you get two maps. So there is the amplitude map and the phase map of the sample. And these two maps, they show uh, image contrast, which is a local probe of the uh, dynamic surface impedance as a function of the excitation frequency. So uh, what is shown here at the different wavelength of the excitation, we took maps of the uh, bilayer, uh, actually, uh, modern bilayer, several layer graphene, and you see multiple uh, patterns, and you can take the larger area, you can see several islands, so um, you can look at the amplitude of phase <coughs> image, and they produce certain uh, contrast, you can zoom in the particular area, and you can zoom even uh, with the high resolution, you can find the small compartments uh, with interesting uh, shape uh, you can look at the different structures. Uh, so what I was going to demonstrate with that image, I'm not talking in detail about any of this, but what I wanted to demonstrate that typically a few hour session on the near field optical microscope produces a whole lot of data. So the major question, we definitely see something. The major question, what exactly do we see with the near field optical microscope? Can we provide interpretation of those images? And for the rest of my talk, I'm going to focus on the interpretation of those images for several materials. And for some of these materials, we understand physics better or material science better. For some of these images, uh, additional studies will be required. So when you do those scans, do you change, do you do a full scan, you change the frequency of this full scan? I'm going to talk about that soon, but to quickly answer your question, yes, we do the scan, change the frequency and do another scan. So the first example of the materials that um, we studied is the atomically thin 2D metal. <coughs> so you probably know about this technique, which is called confined heterotaxy. When you take the silicon carbide by sublimation of silicon, you get graphene, several layers of graphene on the surface of silicon, and then you can etch it with the plasma, make holes, and then elemental metals, they can penetrate, they, they've been sucked under the graphene, and then they can form atomically thin metal. So you can do it with gallon, and this is the TM transmission electron microscopy of the three layer gallium under graphene and showing also EDS to confirm that this is the gallium metal. You can do it with indium, you can do it with silver, tin, and maybe other materials as well. So we did look at the gallium and indium materials with our instruments. So this is one of the first images we took at the uh, and this is very low resolution amplitude map of the surface of the silicon carbide. So definitely there is some contrast. Uh, and what we did here, so you can you look at the amplitude of the second harmonic and the phase of the second harmonic 
overlay it with the FM uh, Z profile. So what you can see here is there are some areas with the different contrast and the high resolution mapping allowed us to understand that what we're seeing here actually is the area where the 2D metal for some reason uh, did not form or disappeared later. And some of these areas, they're actually connected to the wrinkles uh, of graphene. And some of them are connected to the terra step edges of the silicon carbide. So in order to understand what, what is actually going on, we perform much deeper, much, much longer images. So uh, there are four uh, pictures um, showing up here. The red yellow one is again the amplitude of the optical harmonic, second harmonic in this particular case. And where the optical amplitude is high, it's the area where the 2D metal has formed. The dark areas, they correspond other absence of 2D metal or perhaps the areas where the 2D metal has been oxidized because it was not completely sealed with graphene. The second, the uh, pink blue map is the phase of the same of the same area. The two gray images at the bottom, the left image shows the Z profile of the same area, and the second one shows the mechanical phase. This is optical phase, blue is the optical phase, the gray is the mechanical phase. So mechanical phase is actually very good to see <coughs> tiny features on the surface <coughs> of the silicon carbide. So all bright lines that you see here, uh, they correspond either, so the straight line, they correspond to the terrace edge of the silicon carbide and the other lines they correspond to the wrinkles of the graphene on the surface of the silicon carbide. If you look at the uh, left gray image, it shows the Z profile. So obviously we move from the higher terrace to the lower terrace. And then in this particular region, you see uh, semicircular pits that are formed in the silicon carbide, which means that most likely the decomposition in this area went further and most likely we have more layers of graphene uh, on top of the surface of the silicon carbide. So interesting enough, if you overlay these images with the um, optical one, um, definitely the optical images, they do follow wrinkles and the terrace edges, but not always. And they do follow to some extent the Z profile, but again, not always. Obviously, the area with the brightest contrast correspond to the area which is a deep pit in the silicon carbide, which means the number of layers of graphene that cover 2D metal, they have something to do with the optical contrast, optical amplitude of the ethnom signal. If you overlay the same images with the phase, um, you can see that there is a big phase contrast between the metal and no metal that there is also some phase contrast between the areas of the metal that nominally have a similar or almost the same brightness. So um, the conclusion of that is that uh, the correlation of the different channels that we obtain in the single ASNOP imaging, um, it allows you to conclude about the different areas with different materials properties, but definitely some further study will be needed to be uh, quantitative. Uh, yes. Quick, just two questions on the uh, what's the scale bar and the frequency at which you did the maps? Excellent question. So I'm sorry. So the scale bar on that image uh, is so so that image is uh, uh, five by um, I think twelve micrometer. Uh, so uh, that area was large. I think uh, something like uh, ten uh, no 20, twenty by thirteen micrometer. So this area is, um, as far as I remember, one by four microns. So the uh, frequency of the excitation is around six micrometers. I can give you later more accurate frequency. It's, it's, it's about six microns, maybe 6.5, something like that. So that is the similar images taken on the Indian sample. And once again, if you look at the topography, you can see that some of the areas they're uh, etched deeper, which means that they have thicker layer of uh, graphene, probably going beyond monolayer or bilayer. And interesting enough, in that exact areas where we have a, a, a deeper pits, uh, the intensity of the optical signal is typically higher. So this is a, a high resolution images of that area. 
So when you uh, get deeper, which means that the graphene is uh, uh, probably thicker, the optical contrast is higher, except for the regions where the intensity of the optical signal is almost gone. So um, uh, we have to magnify this intensity 20 times to get some resolution. And also the difference in the phase, it indicates that most likely it's either oxidized area or the area where the 2D metal is active. So another example when we can apply uh, s -NOM imaging was with the transition metal decalcagenide sample. Um, the first is the tungsten selenide material, and that was grown on the uh, multi-layered uh, single two-layer uh, and more layer graphene transferred um, on the substrate. So this is the typical FM image. And again, the image is pretty busy because there is an underlying graphene which has a lot of wrinkles. So you can't probably even tell whether you have any tungsten selenide islands on that surface. Maybe these are the examples, but not, not that much more. So when you do amplitude and phase <coughs> ethnome microscopy of the same area, so already amplitude shows some nice triangular islands in this area, not resolvable with the uh, uh, FM itself. And then the phase shows much better contrast. So it appears that there is a lot of tungsten selenide in this area. So here the FM image is overlaid with the phase contrast and there are a few more islands here and there. So the similar study has been done on another sample and uh, the phase image in this particular case gives you a very high degree of the confidence of where your tungsten selenide grown and allows you to tell you that in this particular case, the islands they have very high degree of alignment. And this alignment uh, is in agreement with the lattice alignment of the graphene uh, itself. A similar study has been done on the molybdenum sulfide. So this is the phase um, AFM image of the 10 by 10 micron area of the silicon carbide. Uh, with the epitaxial graphene and then molybdenum sulfide grown on top of that. Um, so if you do optical uh, image and overlay it with the uh, FM, you can see that the pretty much each and every island that you can see in the FM phase, you can also see it in optical. So we do high resolution imaging on the small area. And if you do so, once again, this is the Z profile, the phase FM, optical image and the phase image you can see that actually uh, the multi-layered island, uh, islands, they show as this similar optical contrast, or some of them actually show as the dark optical contrast uh, on the uh, asthma image. So <coughs> we understand that the staking of the multi-layer uh, MOAS2 uh, happens at probably zero twist angle, but it still does influence optical properties of uh, this island. So we also zoomed in the area which appeared to be interesting in the low resolution. So here uh, we have a, a single triangular island. And on top of this triangular island, there is a one more hexagonal island. And there are a few more small triangular islands grown as the higher level pyramids uh, on top of the major level. So interesting enough is that if you go with the even high resolution of the central area, the central area appears pretty much as the single optical um, hexagonal shape. And what it tells us, number one, uh, similar islands possibly could become compartments or reservoirs for confined optical excitation. So that one has been done again at the mid infrared, but now we are looking for capability to do similar experiments with the tunable visible uh, laser uh, or near infrared laser to look at the excitons in this island. So uh, the fact that the whole island, uh, lower level island appears to be optically connected is interesting, which means that the coupling between the um, upper island and the upper hexagon and the lower triangle uh, may be not as strong as we thought at the beginning. So Another interesting uh, finding that, or observation that we had on the same sample. So uh, all these triangular islands shown here in the phase map, 
they are uh, so well appearing because of the age of the island is actually oxidized. So if you look at the, with the high resolution, uh, pretty much each of these islands, they have this bright uh, white area, which appears both in the face and the Z contrast. And this area appears dark in the optical image, uh, which is a, a, a pretty standard indication of the oxidation uh, of the uh, transition metal decalcadenide. They stayed about one week on ending. So, but then we looked at these uh, edges in a little bit uh, larger resolution. So, so uh, what is shown here is that we investigated the area uh, of these uh, uh, yellow rectangles on the uh, large FM image. And one of these islands um, that actually has been uh, looked at the uh, much higher resolution. So first of all, we focused on this island because it was interesting that the growth of this triangular island obviously has been terminated by the terrace edge. But also uh, the edges of the islands, they show double lines. And we looked at these double lines with a little bit uh, higher resolution. So what we did, we did the, we zoomed at that island, but also we changed the wavelength of the excitation to make a hyperspectral image of that termination. So, um, and of course, for some reason, this image is not animating now. <clears throat> Give me a second. Let me try to run this slide once again. Yeah. So, so uh, what you see here is the series of the images taken at the different wavelengths and excitation. And what you should look at is that the, this uh, strip, this ribbon, uh, close to the edge of the island, the thickness of that ribbon is changing with the wavelength. And the same with the um, line that you see at the bottom. So the bottom line actually corresponds to the wrinkle of the graphene. And I'll show later that it is a, a, a regular situation when the reflections from the wrinkle, they have dependence on the wavelength. <coughs> the similar dependence is seen when we make a, a cross-sectional cut through the um, TMDC islands itself. So these observations are interesting, but definitely they also require some further study. So I'm going to explain why graphene wrinkles uh, and possibly TMDC islands could have some dependence of the uh, appeared wrinkle width as a function of the frequency. In order to go through that, um, I'm going to show you a few slides about graphene uh, monolayer, bilayer, and trilayer graphene plasmas. And let me start with the brief introduction into plasmonics. So what is the plasma? So the plasma is actually the collective mode uh, when the electrons they displace in the material from their equilibrium position, they left ions behind. And because of the electrostatic attraction to their ions, there is a restoring force, which would like to bring electrons back. But because of the inertia, if they start moving, they move um, uh, through the equilibrium position, and then the restoring force would like to return them to the equilibrium position. So the oscillation pattern may appear in the material, in the sample. So this oscillation pattern is related to the electromagnetic field. So the oscillation of charge produces the oscillation of electromagnetic field. And that's why surface plasma is tightly connected to the surface electromagnetic wave. So in principle, there is a very simple theory behind that. So you can solve, if you know the conductivity of the sample, you can solve the current as a function of the uh, electric field. And then you can use continuity relation to connect current to the charge density. And then you can relate charge density to the jump of the electric field itself. So you know the conductivity of graphene, which is related <coughs> to the Fermi level. Um, and because of that, you can get very quickly the so-called propagation constant or wave vector connected to the frequency of the plasmon and the propagation of the surface plasmon, the propagation wave vector has two components, one component in plane, which is a real component, and another component is out of plane, which is imaginary. As a result, electromagnetic field decays in the air or vacuum from the surface of 2D material. So the plasmon wavelength, because of these two components, becomes very short compared to the light. And that enables multiple nanophotonics applications. And also, if you can make nanostructures made of plasmonic materials, it produces multiple uh, metamaterials or metasurfaces with uh, um, applications uh, um, 
in many areas from sensing to quantum information. So if we talk about graphene, the relation between the frequency and the wave vector of the plasma in graphene uh, is, is that. So the frequency is proportional to the square root of the plasma wave vector and the charge uh, density or uh, Fermi level. And that is why if you have a nanostructure made of graphene, for example, uh, a disk uh, or hexagonal structure, uh, the wave vector must be quantized. So reflection from the edge or even circumferential motion of the plasma produces uh, patterns shown here, which resemble atomic wave functions uh, with the quantum numbers corresponding to the radial and angular motion. And the uh, quantization produces the wave vector to be proportional to the reciprocal size or radius of the disk. So all of that is very well known. Uh, what is also very well known that the plasmons uh, can get quantization or interference or reflection, which is all synonymous, just from the edge between the monolayer and the bilayer graphene. And that is why, by the way, we see a lot of contrast in these images shown here. So uh, if you look at the particular uh, wrinkles on the two-layer graphene or monolayer graphene or just the boundary between the monolayer and bilayer graphene, you see oscillatory pattern, which happens because, again, because the plasma is getting reflected from the edge and makes a sending wave. By looking at this pattern, we can determine the wavelength of the plasma. And from the wavelength, we can determine the wave vector. And we know the excitation frequency of the laser light. And that allows us to actually play out wavelengths versus the frequency as the dispersion relation or conductivity of the graphene material. We can also look at the small compartment where the plasmons can make standing wave as it was discussed on the previous slide. So this is a typical compartment. And now I need to again to rerun the slide to show you the animation. Yeah, uh, no, it's still not, yeah, here it is. So you can see that the plasmon wave in that compartment actually uh, develops um, uh, a, a lobe in the middle. And this is the uh, um, plasmon wave function in the radial direction as a function of frequency given for the um, second harmonic of the optical signal or for any other harmonics. So you can see the pattern developing here. And this pattern actually appears as the wavelength. And the wavelength can be plotted as a function of frequency for the monolayer graphene. And that allows you to extract the Fermi level in the particular graphene system. We can look at the uh, graphene uh, multilayer islands with the different chirality. And you can extract the plasma dispersion as a function of chirality angle. And you can look at also uh, interesting features that appear in the certain plasmonic structures. I'm going to talk about these features in more detail uh, in the next slide. So I promised to talk about the hyperspectral imaging. So you have seen already several movies. And in order to make such a movie, oh, and before I'm going for that, I'm sorry. I have one more slide of introduction, why we want to look at the multi-layered graphene. So um, almost 10 years ago, Jimmy Lee published a, a seminal paper talking about the twisted bilayer graphene. And uh, uh, very soon in the group of Eva Andre, it was experimentally measured that when you have graphene, which is superimposed. So if you have uh, uh, one layer of graphene shown in red and another layer, placed on top of the first layer with a certain twist angle, um, you form structures, periodic structures, superlative structures. And depending on the angle of twist, you can get interesting peaks in the electronic densities of space. So these peaks are uh, interesting, uh, not only from the theoretical point of view, and this paper shows that you can observe them. The interesting component about these peaks is that when the angle becomes really small, uh, the amplitude of these peaks uh, can reach very high values uh, that may produce superconductivity and other strong correlation effect in the twisted bilayer sample. So the question of the twist angle is not an acad of academic interest. Uh, um, it's of interest for materials engineering uh, in such a sample. So hyperspectral mode of imaging. So when you shine the light on the graphene sample and take a map, 
You can tune the wavelength uh, of your light. You take another map, you tune the wavelength again, take another map, then you make a stack. And the stack of the maps, uh, looking at the difference uh, in the amplitude or phase or both, uh, you look at the contrast and you look how the contrast is changing as a function of the wavelength. What you could do then, you can see the areas that are determined by the contrast and you can see that these areas are actually broken on the sub areas. So if you look at the image of that sample in the larger uh, area, you can start seeing that uh, there are certain regions of the same contrast. And these regions, they actually correspond, as you can see here, uh, to amplitude or phase, depending on the frequency and, and, and developing certain peaks. So the peaks and the frequency, they related to the optical conductivity or dielectric function of the sample. So if you have a peak, it corresponds to the certain loss in the sample. So it is not, um, it's very rational, it's very natural to think about what's the frequency of the peak and what this frequency could correspond to. So, uh, and also uh, if you look at the shapes of the samples that we uh, uh, study here, from the separate, um, uh, from the paper that uh, was published a couple of years ago, we know that the uh, certain shapes, they correspond to the certain twist angles uh, of the bilayer island. So there is a correlation between the peaks in the optical uh, um, uh, signal and the twist angle of the bilayer graphene. Um, again, um, seven, eight years ago, um, it was a paper where the uh, theoretical study was done about uh, mix between the plasmons uh, that develop in graphene and the phonons in the substrate. And at the point where these um, uh, two excitations, phonons and plasmons, they interact, uh, then uh, there is a hybridization of the modes. Uh, every time when you have hybridization of the modes, uh, the small gap appears between these excitations. And you can get hybridization between the phonons of the substrate, but you can also have hybridization of the plasmons with the phonon modes of the graphene itself. So what we see in our samples, and this is a typical bilayer sample with the um, different locations showing different twist angles, um, the real and imaginary components of the optical signal plotted versus the frequency of the excitation uh, in the so-called Nyquist plot, they show uh, a region where the phase is changing very quickly and then the optical signal makes a turn in the Nyquist, um, in the, uh, Nyquist area. So such a turns are typical for pretty much every sample we looked at with the multi-layered graphene. So the green line shows the AB twisted graphene and there is an obvious uh, turn. But if you zoom in the area shown by the red and uh, uh, blue data, which corresponds to the graphene with the smaller twist angle, um, you can see similar patterns develop as well. So looking at these patterns uh, at the frequency uh, where the turn appears uh, and comparing that with the Raman maps of the same sample, we can identify the uh, twist angle of the specific areas and we can uh, combine the high resolution nanometer scale resolution asnom images with the diffraction limited Raman maps to tell about the uh, actual uh, twist structure of the multi-layered graphene. So uh, at the end of the talk, I would like to show you a couple of slides uh, regarding the uh, correlation analysis of the data that we take in with the ASNO machine. So when you take an image of the typical sample, and here we're looking at the exfoliated multi-layer graphene plate, if you take a, um, a, an image in the, phase, in the amplitude or phase of the optical signal, you're typically getting uh, hundreds to thousands of points of the data. If you take it at the multiple frequencies, you start talking about tens of thousands of the data points. And uh, immediately the question appears how to analyze this data and how to distinguish different physical zones. So for example, here we were interested to look at the, whether we can determine uh, ABC over the ABA stacking of the tri-layer graphene 
or other uh, lattice registry regarding the twist. So if you take, for example, the um, amplitude and phase and plot it as the Nyquist plot, again, as the complex number in the plane, and do statistics, you can see that uh, for that particular sample, uh, the data clusters around certain values. So the biggest cluster appears to be the substrate. So after removing this substrate, you can still see two clusters. And these two clusters, they correspond to the uh, reddish and yellowish areas on our sample. You can look at these areas at, with the high resolution and definitely both amplitude and phase, uh, they distinguish certain areas on the multi-layered graphene that show no contrast on the FM itself. So we believe what we were able to see with this complex impedance uh, is the registry of the multi-layered graphene, most likely related to the uh, ADC or ADA type of the statement. So, uh, and then the similar way, if you look at the uh, different areas of the AB stack by layer or tri-layer, you can look at the uh, map you can uh, um, definitely find the clusters corresponding to the monolayer graphene, to the zero layer or 30 degree um, stacked graphene. And you can study them as a function of the frequency. Uh, now I have to rerun it to show you the animation. Oops, yeah. So uh, this one shows the uh, modulation of the distribution function uh, as, as we change the excitation of the laser light. So by looking at the dynamics uh, of the peaks of the clusters, um, you can uh, get additional information about the materials properties as a function of the uh, laser light. So with that, I would like to conclude. So I hope I was able to show you today that the ASNOM imaging allows to identify materials properties, for example, composition of the 2D metal or structure of the transition metal decalcagonite island or twist in the chiral materials. And we can do it at the nanometer resolution. So the high resolution ASNOM allows also hyperspectral imaging, which reveals the optical properties, for example, polariton dispersion and other physical properties like uh, plasma component hybridization and the coupling strength. But of course, was a capability to get quantitative information requires developing detailed methods of theoretical analysis. So the SNOM allows mapping of materials, 2D materials and materials outside of the traditional 2 dm So what is shown here is, uh, this is an example of the graphene nanoribbons, uh, plasmonic cadmium oxide materials, uh, uh, photonic crystals, colloidal crystals, uh, viruses on the surface, and even protein microtubules. So with that, the last thing I would like to mention is that I would like to spread the word. Um, the postdoc position um, is open to work with this instrumentation and would like to thank people who contribute to that research. Josh Robinson, John Bradwin, uh, Knu, Ben, Junju, uh, Michael and Chinyi, my students, uh, Tobias at Mia, Tobias Gokos at Mia Stack and Mark Romelli who provided the uh, graphene sample uh, for that study. And thank you for your attention. I'm ready for questions. Good questions. So you said it's uh, um, potentially uh, viable to do ultrasound uh, the process so the question is whether it's viable to use this machine to do uh, time dependent measurements or pump probe uh, spectroscopy. Yes, uh, so um, it has been already demonstrated in several publications that uh, the very same machine uh, can be used for the pump probe measurements, which means time resolved uh, uh, mapping uh, and uh, in principle, uh, it, it should be possible to do uh, spectroscopic studies uh, um, in the same way. That requires, of course, that your pump probe uh, laser, um, short pulse laser, will be tunable in that range. Do you need to focus down to the 
yes, of course, you have to focus them to the same spot, but this is actually relatively painless. So I mentioned that our machine has um, two laser sources, but in a sense, it's not two. It's actually uh, four chips for the mid infrared laser and uh, six channels for the visible laser. So, which means that the focusing of the different chips and different lasers on the same tip is not only possible, again, it's relatively straightforward. So you need to focus them on the same mirror, but after you focus them on the same mirror, other engineering details has been worked out. So for the plasma study, there's definitely a frequency dependence on plasma. Is it assumed that, because it, it could also be an orientation dependence because you're changing the wave vector of light, is it assumed that all the wave vector is oriented to a specific or so, light and scattered light? Yeah, so the question is um, for the plasmonic studies, uh, whether there is any dependence on the actual wave vector of light in addition to the frequency of the incident light. Yeah. So the common assumption, uh, and uh, um, I emphasize common assumption, which means that I can only repeat what, what we read in the literature, but I cannot tell you whether it's 100% true. The common assumption is that the tip works as the vertical antenna. If the tip works as the vertical antenna to excite the plasmons, uh, the wave vector of light is in a sense already irrelevant. So the vertical antenna doesn't know about the wave vector of, I mean, direction of light in a sense. Uh, whether this approximation is 100% correct, probably not. So how much of influence it has on the actual maps that we're taking I don't know, in a sense, in order to be able, yeah, yeah. In, order, in order to be able to study that, what we would need, we would need a capability to turn our laser uh, uh, light at a different angle, or the capability to rotate the sample in a controllable way. Uh, currently, we can only rotate the sample with the hand, which probably does not qualify for such a study. Yeah. And the laser light cannot be rotated because it must be focused on the parabolic mirror. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, hmm? you know, change uh, control of the polarization of the light? Um, we have a polarizer, yeah. but the polarizer is normally used to change the intensity of the incident beam. Um, so intensity of the incident beam is changing together with the polarization. So we, we cannot decouple those two things. So questions online. Yeah. Yeah, so from online, are you planning to implement temperature dependent dynamic imaging? So the temperature dependent measurement is limited to our capability to place something inside the FM chamber. So the uh, FM chamber is the room temperature FM. So in order to do at least some temperature dependent measurements, we must have a thermoelectric cooling or heating stage inside the chamber. Currently, we don't have it. So this isn't an add-on that exists that you could? Uh, no, we have to build it. So the company itself uh, provides the cryo FM, but the cryo FM is not, it, it's a separate instrument. So it's not, I mean, it's not like we can replace stage and, and, and use it at the cryo temperatures. Uh, it will require pretty much the same investment to buy the instrument that would be capable of doing measurements at low temperature. Okay, and the second question from the same speaker, is it possible to do imaging on electrically biased TV lasers? Yes, but that will require again for somebody to develop a stage uh, that will have um, um, wires to the, to the sample. It's not too complicated. Um, I mean, in the regular FM, um, it is doable, so we should be able to do it for our stage. Well, and anyway, so if there is a, a specific interest for such a measurement, uh, we can talk about that. Are these on the standard, like, Omicron flag holders, or is it a different uh, sample? 
So it's not Omicron, but yes, this is the standard uh, piezo stage. So the FM itself, it, it's based on um, um, what's the name of that Germany based company? Um, no, 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 no. Um, Oh, no, no. VTEC uses the same stage, but the uh, there is a big, large company which produces pretty much all the um, piezo stages in Europe. Mm, no, 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 no. But that's then again. This is standard FM stage. Yeah. Um, I think I I showed that image uh, earlier. Oops. I think I stopped sharing um, accidentally. Um, yeah, this is the standard stage. I stopped sharing, sorry. Um, I was going, yeah. Any other questions? Was there a particular place in here? Yeah, I wanted to show the... It's not moving for me. I want to move to one of the earlier slides. Yeah, this one. You can go ahead. Yeah. So. Uh, oh, that's not going to work quite. Okay. Well. I'll just give one second and I will, just so everyone can see. Okay. There you go. Now you should be able to. Yeah. So this is the stage here. So anything that can be placed, oh, probably it, you cannot see. Yeah, I, I'm not sure how to. Yeah, I, I can use the mouse. So here, uh, this is this is the stage. This is the stage. So there is not a whole lot of room. But there is definitely room to place the sample with a couple of wires uh, so we can bias the sample. And if we place it on the thermoelectric cooler or, or heating stage, we can control the temperature in the small range of probably plus minus uh, 30, 40 degrees. OK, are there any other questions? If not, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> <laughs>